Good day, everyone. It's, it's nice to welcome you to the third session of our NIH webinar series, Moving from Hepatitis Discovery to Elimination, where we begin to highlight um, NIH-supported uh, uh, or conducted research that's advancing progress toward our goals for hepatitis elimination in the United States and globally. I'm Dr. John Ward. I'm the director of the Coalition for Global Hepatitis Elimination at the Task Force for Global Health. Uh, uh, and, and we're partners in uh, developing and presenting this uh, webinar series uh, uh, to you. Um, um, uh, the, uh, the topics for these uh, webinar sessions are, are brought together by a um, uh, organizing uh, committee um, representing uh, the different institute and offices within NIH, as well as our colleagues at the uh, U.S. Uh, Centers for Disease Control um, and uh, uh, Prevention. Um, we, we would like for this to, uh, webinar to be as interactive as possible. I know many of you on, on, on the webinar today are very familiar with Zoom, but uh, just a, a, as a reminder to please post your questions and comments uh, in chat. You can also post your questions in Q&A, but it, for both of those, we'll be monitoring them to capture uh, those questions and, and do our best to present those to the panelists and presenters you know, as we move through the program. Um, in addition, the, uh, these presentations are recorded and uh, those recordings and the um, slide sets uh, the answers to the questions, and a synthesis that summarizes the uh, presentations and comments uh, will be available um, as they are with the other sessions in the webinar series uh, on the coalition website at uh, globalhep.org. And we hope you'll find those enduring materials uh, very um, helpful um, to you. Um, um, so let's, let's begin. Uh, uh, into the uh, to the session itself, you know, I, for me, uh, I find you know this is really, um, in many ways, uh, the cornerstone of this webinar series. Um, disease elimination uh, initiatives have clear and very profound public health purposes. By setting goals, you're striving to create a sense of urgency, bring key partners to the table to fill essential roles and to meet targets in reducing transmission and reducing mortality, as we're trying to do, particularly for hepatitis B and hepatitis C. But all of those activities are really striving to achieve an overarching goal of health equity. Because if you really meet those disease elimination requirement, uh, uh, goals, it really requires the program to focus on those populations that are most marginalized, but oftentimes are at the highest risk of having those um, um, uh, risk um, uh, modes of risky behaviors or exposures that lead to transmission or not getting the care they need for testing and treatment to prevent mortality. And so we're going to be going through and highlighting some key uh, uh, health disparities related to hepatitis and how we can begin to tackle those so that we can achieve that overarching goal for our disease elimination programs. So I'm very um, pleased to, uh, to turn it over to my colleague, Dr. Rena Das, who's the Program Director, Division of Integrated Biological and Behavioral Sciences at the National Institute on Minority Health and Health Disparities. Rena. Thank you, John, and thank you everybody for joining us. Welcome to this session organized by NIMHD and Office of AIDS Research. Uh, so today we really have a packed agenda with talks focused on really understanding some of the complex causes of liver disease and liver cancer disparities, and how do we address these disparities in different underserved population within the United States. So um, with uh, we have uh, in this effort of under, uh, really understanding the causes, we have partnered with NCI on this effort and we have created some funding opportunities so uh, please take a look at that. Um, so we have uh, four speakers today for today's sessions and three discussions. And before we begin, we are really delighted that we have our institute directors who are going to provide some opening remarks. So uh, next slide. So we'll start with introduction from Dr. Eliseo Perez-Table, 
who is the director of National Institute of Minority Health and Health Disparities. Uh, Dr. Perez Table is a general, general internal medicine expert. He has been doing this for 37 years at the University of California, San Francisco before moving to NIH. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Perez Estable. Thank you very much, Rina. And I'm delighted to see uh, uh, friends and uh, colleagues here uh, on, this, on the video. Um, and uh, also thank Maureen for uh, helping support this. Uh, effort. Uh, I think it's a timely topic, and uh, I guess for once we're not going to talk about COVID, uh, at least not uh, not the whole hour. Um, I'm going to share my screen and take you through a quick uh, summary of some of the issues that I consider uh, critical here, uh, just to uh, either um, uh, uh, provoke uh, a little bit or uh, um, uh, just share my biases. Um, so um, thank you, Rena, for having uh, uh, reminded me of all the efforts that are going here. So I'll start with, you know, for maybe any of you uh, redundant, but just for the whole audience, what we call populations with health disparities. Uh, the first three bullets listed here were in our legislation. Um, so I guess we'll take a congressional act to change that. All minority groups and OMB refers to the census. I, I had a question about what does OMB have to do with anything? Uh, less, less, privileged, uh, less privileged socioeconomic status, so poor people of all colors, and then underserved rural residents. In 2016, we added sexual and gender minorities, or we declared uh, a population with health disparities um, for NIH research purposes in an effort led by um, uh, Larry Tabak that, that began several years before I, s I arrived at NIH in 2015. But a health outcome that is worse in one of these groups it, compared to a reference population defines a health disparity. Usually the reference population has, uh, is, is uh, the, the, that with better outcomes. Uh, and we also embrace the notion that all of these groups have a social disadvantage that results in part from having been subject to discrimination or racism and to also being underserved in healthcare. I also want to reiterate um, that race and socioeconomic status, race, ethnicity, and socioeconomic status are fundamental in determining health. Uh, race, ethnicity is a, a social construct that is self-identified. It explains variants that we don't fully understand, and therefore we should continue to measure it and use it uh, in research, and I would argue in clinical care. Uh, for another time, we could debate that. Uh, socioeconomic status is, is much more often ignored in uh, clinical research than race ethnicity, not in population science, and it needs to be incorporated more routinely. Uh, they predict life expectancy, mortality, and numerous other outcomes, some of which are listed here. Strokes in African Americans are twice as common as, as in whites from the regards uh, observational study uh, for the same level of uh, systolic blood pressure. Uh, most chronic diseases are more common in pe who, people who are poor and it's, no, it's not because of behavior. Uh, and I think we need to understand that better. And then among persons with diabetes, um, all minority groups studied have more diabetes, but they also all have less heart, heart attacks and heart failure, but more renal disease. And again, I don't think anyone fully understands why. These are some social determinants of health, not to uh, say that it's only about race, ethnicity, and, and, and social class, but it really many other factors influence and interact. Uh, and uh, these are the social determinants. You could go on and add environmental and, um, and uh, uh, biological ones that also influence these things. We've been working on trying to standardize these as much as possible and encouraging our uh, extramural um, investigator community to, to go to the Phoenix Toolkit website and use our, the measures that we have agreed to vet. Um, and, uh, and, we, and we see that that's increased. And in, uh, recently, uh, Monica Webb Hooper, our deputy director, uh, informed me that it had gotten a fair amount of attention in its first year of existence. This is our research framework. Again, all our PIs are encouraged to refer to it, or at least it's in all our funding opportunity announcements as to where the research might be. And you can imagine elimination of hepatitis really uh, can span the entire spectrum here. Uh, from both implementation, societal issues, as well as uh, how individuals accept or not accept different interventions and every interaction with the healthcare system. But on hepatitis specifically, these are my biases. So 
first of all, we've had a, a very effective tool to prevent hepatitis B now for, I think it's going on 40 years or 30 years, sorry, um, with vaccines. And eventually we'll continue to see a decrease in rates. Um, Taiwan has experienced a, a marked decrease in, in liver cancer, for example, as a consequence of this. And I think much of the hepatitis B now being transmitted in the US is, is based on vertical transmission and immigrants uh, who come into the country or who live in this country with chronic hepatitis B. So uh, this, is, this is reachable. Um, then hepatitis C, as you know, you know, breakthrough discovery of uh, medications that can eradicate, you know, 95% of, uh, of the variants that uh, predominate in the United States, at least, with uh, one, you know, eight to 12 weeks of therapy. Uh, I mean, this is a game changer. Um, it's a cure. Uh, of course, people can be reinfected, so we still need to attend to that. Uh, and, and hep C liver transplants have actually de from uh, related to hep C have decreased as a consequence. So again, reachable goal. We have effective tools to, to do this. Uh, we all know it's a causal pathway, hepatitis to liver cancer and chronic liver disease is not the only one. Uh, uh, steatotosis, uh, fatty in induced inflammation, cirrhosis of any kind and aflatoxins are all well known and, and there are others, uh, less prevalent ones. Uh, but liver cancer is actually increasing in all racial ethnic minority populations. And on the clinical end of the spectrum, uh, controversial, but some would say that we should target uh, screening for liver cancer. And then early treatment has made some progress, at least the last time I, I was connected to the clinical world uh, several years ago. And I assume that that has not uh, uh, regressed, but uh, may be continuing to slowly increase. Okay. Just show you some data of things that I think uh, most of you are familiar with. Uh, this is hepatitis C, uh, startling increase in American Indian Alaska Natives, uh, completely within uh, our wheelhouse at NIMHD. What is going on here? It's only 2% of the US population, but this, it, what, what's, what's going on? What can we do to address this uh, more directly? Uh, and then you can see some slight increases across. You used to say it's a baby boomer issue and I'm a baby boomer, full disclosure. It's clearly not a baby boomer only issue. And we need to, uh, to uh, shift that mentality in terms of how we approach it. Uh, liver cancer in this uh, complicated slide, but you can see that the curves are all moving in the wrong direction uh, from year 2000, 2017. Well, this one's going down uh, and it's Asian Pacific Islanders. And that's probably because the high prevalence of hepatitis B has been addressed more systematically and hepatitis B has been the primary causal factor perhaps in, in liver cancer in that population. Uh, and you can see a male female difference here in liver cancer. Um, again, I'm not sure that we know the, 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 you know, what the factors are that explain that, uh, but you can see that uh, compared to whites, uh, certainly uh, every, uh, one of these minority groups, and, and for this purpose, Pacific Islanders are probably in the same direction as Asians uh, are higher than whites. And that this is a result of an of analysis of uh, birthplace, U.S. born Latinos and foreign born Latinos. So just focus on liver cancer in men down here. And you can see for, uh, and this is California and Texas. So try to get at, you know, policy-wide, uh, statewide policy, perhaps access to Medicaid, much, much better in California than Texas. Uh, particularly for ambulatory care. Uh, you can see that for Blacks, the mortality uh, of, uh, of uh, liver cancer in men is, uh, is lower uh, than it is for U.S.-born Latinos. U.S.-born Latinos have a higher mortality from liver cancer than, than immigrants. So this is not a, immigrants come in with uh, worse disease. It's actually worse with U.S.-born. So this is a case where being acculturated or being in this country is really worse for your health. And among whites, it's half the rate uh, or, or less. Um, I can move this. Oh, uh, Rena, I am going into, my computer is going to um, stop working. So uh, I think you should uh, continue with the next presentation. Sorry. I have to. Uh, we can have your slides uh, run here. Will that work for you? Well, um, I you can you can speak to my slides because I, my computer is about to crash. <laughs> it's a problem I haven't been able to get fixed. It's the first time it's happened during a talk, though. <laughs> Sorry. So, uh, 
is your audio going to work or do you want us to take over the slides? So Lindsay, do you want to uh, run the slides? We'll see if that's possible. Um, I, I don't know how many slides were remaining, but perhaps not to delay us too badly, unless we can get- Yeah, I think he's almost done. Yeah, so I think maybe uh, we'll be, the, the whole slide presentation will be available, but, but perhaps we'll move on to the next speaker. Okay. Um, Lindsay, do you want to put up the next slide? Okay, so um, sorry about the uh, audio uh, with Dr. Paris Estable. Basically, um, uh, what he was trying to say is that NIMHD is very interested in this topic and uh, is fully supportive of this effort. So it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Dr. Maureen Goodenow, who is the Director of Office of AIDS Research uh, she also holds the title of NIH Associate Director for AIDS Research. And Dr. Goodenow uh, served as a professor of pathology, immunology, and lab medicine at the University of Florida, Gainesville, uh, before coming here. And she served as the endowed chair for AIDS Research. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Goodenow for some remarks. Thank you, Rena, for the introduction and for the opportunity to provide some opening remarks. The NIH Office of AIDS Research is pleased to co-sponsor today's webinar with the National Institute on Minority Health and Health Disparities. The Office of AIDS Research, OAR, was established by Congress in 1988 to develop the NIH-wide HIV strategic plan based on emerging scientific priorities and to allocate the HIV budget of the NIH across the institute centers and offices that have HIV research programs. The NIH research budget is currently just over $3 billion a year and represents about six to 7% of the overall NIH budget. OAR works with the NIH Office of the Director to establish the HIV and HIV related research priorities, which include health disparities and HIV-associated comorbidities and co-infections, such as hepatitis, both of which are being discussed this afternoon. In thinking about today's webinar and the big picture view of HIV and hepatitis, it's important to note that both HIV and viral hepatitis are the only two infectious diseases with US national strategic plans. These plans are developed by the Department of Health and Human Services with input from multiple agencies, including the NIH, and provide a roadmap for a coordinated federal response to prevent, identify, treat, and eliminate these infections. Each national strategic plan includes clearly articulated needs for NIH-supported research to inform the goals and priorities of the plans and ultimately their implementation. Investments by the NIH HIV research program in HIV and hepatitis are broad and include basic and clinical research. The majority of studies focus on developing or improving therapies for hepatitis in people with HIV, address behavior, social, and structural factors in the development of interventions for people with substance use disorders and co-infections, and identifying factors associated with disease uh, disease progression related to co-infection. The CDC reports uh, people with HIV in the United States are at increased risk of developing chronic viral hepatitis and liver disease. About 21% of the people with HIV in the United States, which is more than a million currently, also have hepatitis C, while 60 to 80% of people with HIV who inject drugs have hepatitis C. Co-infection by HIV and hepatitis C more than triples the odds for liver disease, liver failure, and liver-related death. And infection by hepatitis viruses may complicate HIV treatment. Although effective treatments are currently available for HIV as well as hepatitis, health disparities persist. As you just heard, the burdens of hepatitis infection overlap the HIV epidemic, especially in rural and Southern US communities 
with disparate and poorer outcomes among minority populations. Similar to HIV, contributing factors include limited access to quality healthcare, poverty, and substance use disorders. To mitigate these inequalities, steps must be taken to evaluate and improve data collection, to identify where challenges exist, focus on culturally appropriate and patient-centered care, and ensure that the research supported by the NIH prioritizes and addresses the needs of those most impacted by these epidemics. OAR certainly shares the NIH and specifically the NIMHD mission and commitment to eliminating these disparities. I look forward to hearing from today's panelists and to continuing to work together to advance research on hepatitis elimination. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Goodenow, for those wonderful remarks. So with that, let's get started with our speakers. Uh, our first speaker is Dr. Grace Ma, who is the Associate Dean for Health Disparities, Founding Director of Center for Asian Health, and is a professor at the Lewis Katz School of Medicine, Temple University. Dr. Ma is going to present to us on Break the Silence, Using an Integrated Approach to Eliminating Hepatitis-Related Liver Disease Disparities Among Asian Americans. Dr. Ma, please take it away. Thank you. Good afternoon. I would like to sincerely thank Dr. Rena Das and the Planning Committee for your invitation. Thank you for the opportunity. So my presentation is going to focus on primarily on breaking the silence and using integrated approach to eliminating hepatitis-related liver disease among Asian Americans. Next slide, yeah. And as uh, uh, we know that liver cancer inc incidence, um, it has fastest increase than any other cancer in the United States. Next slide. So in terms of the major uh, preventive risk factors, actually hepatitis, um, is the major risk factor for 65% um, of the liver cancer related uh, disease. And there are also other risk factors related to obesity, alcohol, fatty liver. So these are really preventable risk factors. Next slide. I want to just talk about the racial ethnic disparities in mortality rates specifically for hepatitis B uh, chronic liver disease in the US. And I wanted to focus on um, the chart on the D. And you can see with uh, the green line on the D graph, that represents uh, Asian Americans who have hepatitis B related liver disease. It's a three times higher than other ethnic groups. And uh, the red line is um, African American. The blue is um, white and the purple is Latino population. Next slide, please. So how common is hepatitis B in the US? We have about 2.2 million people are infected with the hepatitis B. And unfortunately, and the majority of them have not been diagnosed. Only a one third, 33% of these people infected were diagnosed. So there's a really a lot of efforts needs to put out and to, um, for increasing uh, testing and the linkage to care. So majority of these people who are infected with type B are foreign born, either from Asia or Africa. Next slide. So as I mentioned, API um, have the highest prevalence rates of hepatitis B infection than any other racial ethnic groups in the US. And API represent about 6% of US population, but they represent about 58% of all persons living with hepatitis B. So this is a huge disparities that needs to be addressed. Next slide, please. So I'm just to give a, a, a map of uh, Philadelphia and New York City, where the concentrations of hepatitis B uh, infected people that we are highly um, concentrated by um, Asian and African immigrants in the Southwest, 
of Philadelphia and Northeast and uh, Central um, Philadelphia. And also in different barrels, we have a darker blue maps where uh, the uh, hepatitis B infected uh, people are concentrated geographically by um, this area. Thank you. Next slide. So the next few slides, I wanted to focus on some of the NIH funded research projects that we had uh, addressing uh, liver disease and the cancer disparities at the Center for Asian Health, Temple Lewis Cass School of Medicine. Next slide. Our research has focused on this continuum of interventions for uh, liver disease prevention and management of from primary secondary prevention to patient-centered uh, care for hepatitis B patients. Um, we had uh, R1 cluster randomized trials using uh, multi-level intervention or um, community-based intervention specifically to increase Hep B screening, vaccination, and then we moved into um, the patient-focused PCORI-funded projects specifically uh, navigating the patients um, for follow-up care and uh, to prevent uh, liver disease and liver cancer. Next slide. Here's one of uh, those uh, cluster randomized trials and results. On the left map, you'll see um, all, of, all the patients and participants that we have worked in these zip codes and uh, neighborhoods, a very low screening rate. And the post hour intervention, where you see the dark blue of those participants in these zip codes have participated in screening. These are specifically focused on um, the Vietnamese and the Korean Americans. Next slide. So I want to talk a little bit about the intervention approaches that we have used. And we adopted multi level intervention to address the multi level disparities among this population. At the individual level, we have used culturally, linguistically appropriate interventions to educate the patients and participants and navigate them throughout the health system, trying to reduce the barriers. In addition, we also work with healthcare providers, trying to adopt some flexible um, policies and uh, schedules to accommodate, to provide more um, linguistically and uh, appropriate services, culturally, appropriate services as well uh, as um, training the patient, uh, training the clinical staff and uh, with more sensitivity related to the population needs. We also have engaged our community leaders in every step of our program planning evaluation as well as dissemination. Next slide, please. So here are the, the major area that we addressed in our intervention, specifically related to access to care. And uh, many uh, of the Asian populations that are lack of health insurance. Health insurance can be one of the major factors for screening and the linkage to care, as well as the um, culturally, linguistically appropriate services available to the, staff, uh, to the um, participants and the patients. Oftentimes we have observed um, there's a lack of recommendation from healthcare providers. So we provide um, the physician education and to these um, physicians, the clinical staff who serve the population. We also are uh, trying to address the low socioeconomic status and the misinformation about high B transmission. And, and specifically, we're trying to um, negotiate with federal qualified health centers and clinics to see how we can reduce the price for um, testing and the screening for these participants. And we also trying to um, uh, educate them related to the discrimination matters. And uh, so these are all at multiple levels. Next slide, please. Again, this is one of the studies, as I mentioned earlier, and we used a multi-level approach. As a result, we're able to observe a high screening rate, about 88% among the uh, Vietnamese American populations. Next slide. 
So this is one of the studies that was originally funded by an MHD uh, using community-based participatory approach to enhancing hepatitis B screening and the vaccination for underserved Korean Americans. We specifically worked with faith community and working with the 32 Korean churches, randomized um, inter intervention the control group. And we had multiple measures at baseline post six months and 12 months assessments. Our primary outcome is behavior change on HIV screening and the vaccination. We also target to change the knowledge and attitudes, not only at the uh, individual level, but also community um, leaders. Next slide, please. So this is the results of this study. We are able to observe high screening rates among this, these participants in the intervention group, about 92%. And we also have identified those who need vaccination. Next slide. With these multi-level and the community-based participatory approach, we have developed um, robust intervention, evidence-based intervention strategies. So we're able to um, achieve a high vaccination rate as a first shot, about 92%, second shot, 90%. And with the third vaccination shots received about 84%. So we have learned a lot through this process. Actually, right now we're using this model and trying to help with the COVID-19 uh, vaccination. We have developed some um, very robust um, patient navigation uh, strategies, more culturally, linguistically appropriate, and working with community leaders and partners, faith leaders at every step to set up mobile uh, clinics and also navigating these um, community members into uh, the vaccination. Next slide, please. Uh, this is a study specifically focused on hepatitis B patients. As we know, the adherence rate for monitoring and the treatment medication is extremely low because oftentimes when they do not have symptoms, it's not their priority to go to see doctors. So we also developed these uh, strategies, whether it's in-person or virtual patient navigation, text message, um, mobile um, intervention to help these patients to get regular um, screening and uh, follow-up testing. As a guideline, it does require high B patients to follow up with their physicians every six months because we, there is no cure for hepatitis B. And we are able to uh, bring up the follow-up rate as about 77% for the intervention group at six months follow-up. And at 12 months, we're able to observe about 90% adherence. And in terms of liver function testing and other related um, screening and testing for these population, we also have received um, and observed significant increase uh, for the patients at six months, about 52%, and at 12 months, about 75%. Next slide, please. And next a few slides, I wanted quickly to share of some of the community uh, outreach and the engagement activity and with the uh, African-American, Asian, and the Latino population. This is out of our U54 um, partnership at Temple University, Fox Street's Cancer Center, and the Hunter College funded by NCI. Uh, we're in our uh, third year. One of the components is our outreach core is targeting a number of cancer sites. So the liver cancer specifically related to the hepatitis and other risk factors. So we have engaged the community actually, and Ada is one of our community partners and you can hear more from her. And we uh, worked with community partners, educating the community members, and also assessed at the pre, post, and six months. And during the COVID, we actually conduct, con conducted a virtual uh, uh, education. And prior to that time, we did in-person. So now we change it to hybrid. Next slide. <clears throat> so again, working with the community engagement, we must increase, uh, we must building the capacity with the community members. So during the COVID time, we actually provided a training of how to Zoom 
and how to online, uh, online survey, how to conduct a social media campaign. Together, we work with um, the community leaders and the members to implement this um, um, effort. Next slide, please. Here again, as there are some highlights of our outreach campaign and so social media, because each ethnic groups have their own social media channels. For example, the Chinese population are using WeChat oftentimes to communicate. So we're using some ethnic channels um, to communicate. We also conducted on the bus campaign. Actually, this is a before COVID. Next one, please. Here, I wanted to quickly just to share some results about knowledge improvement. Uh, through this uh, education process, we have actually seen some significant improvement uh, before and after the education uh, among all these groups in terms of whether vac uh, Hep B vaccine is the best prevention. You'll see the yellow line is actually the improvement of knowledge, whether Hep C can be cured, whether baby boomers are the higher risks of uh, risk of um, liver cancer and Hep C related, et cetera. Next slide, please. And we also look at other risk factors, not only with hepatitis B and C, but also alcohol, obesity, uh, as well as diabetes. We see the green uh, bars, these are post-education um, results. So this does not mean they have conducted screening, but at least we began to improve the knowledge of the community. Next slide. So I wanted to conclude this talk just by um, sharing, and I'm sure all of you are aware of that, the major goals of viral hepatitis national strategic plan for 2021 and 2025, which is in line with the work we're doing and trying to prevent new viral hepatitis infection, improve viral hepatitis uh, outcomes and reduce disparities and improve uh, surveillance data usage, especially achieve integrated, coordinated efforts that to address the hepatitis epidemics among all partners and the stakeholders. Next slide. So I wanted to share with you uh, my uh, perspective related to some of the opportunities for eliminating health dispar uh, hepatitis health disparities. I think we do need rigorous promotion for hepatitis B vaccination. The screening recommendations and need to be promoted to increase efforts nationally to get high-risk adults for Hep B in the C testing, linkage to care. I think all these evidence-based intervention that we have conducted in the controlled trial needs to be implemented at large scale at the population level and in the implementation programmatical trial in the real world, whether it's clinical or community setting, so that could have a higher, larger impact. And I firmly believe community partnership engagement is essential to successful recruitment, retention, and population impact. Expansion of training and education for community health workers and the clinical staff and how we can work together. Expand hepatitis treatment, access to insurance. And many of our community Members do not have insurance. One third of Korean Americans do not have insurance. Over 20, 20%, 25% of Chinese, Vietnamese do not have health insurance. So these are the things that will hesitate and, and to seek care. Integration of public health and clinical care services. We got to expand our work with federal qualified health centers, community clinics throughout the city and increase our support to address chronic viral hepatitis in the US and globally. And I think there is a lot of opportunities that we can actually eliminate hepatitis disparities by 2030. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Ma. Um, we ran over just a minute. So uh, I would suggest that uh, people send in your questions in the chat box and Dr. Ma would address them. And if we have some questions, we can wait till the panel discussion while other speakers are finishing their talks, then we can entertain more questions. Thank you, Dr. Ma, for really a wonderful um, presentation and letting us know how if it 
uh, with the community, how successful these efforts can be. Uh, so with that, let's move on to the next speaker. Uh, our next speaker uh, is uh, Dr. Um, Wendy Satyavan, and she is going to uh, be, she's a professor of medicine and preventive uh, she's a professor of medicine and preventive medicine at University of Southern California. She's also the associate, associate director for population sciences in USC Research Center for Liver Diseases. She's an epidemiologist by training and focused on understanding the determinants of ethnic differences in cancer incidence, mortality among different populations. Her research interests include chronic liver disease and liver cancer. And today she's going to present to us on multi-level determinants of ethnic disparities in liver disease in the United States. Dr. Setiavan, it's all yours. Take it away. Thanks, Dr. Das. So good afternoon, everybody. I'm delighted to be part of this webinar, especially thank Dr. Rena Das and the committee for the invitation. So today I'll be talking about the multi-level determinants of racial ethnic disparities in liver disease in the United States, focusing on Hep B and Hep C related liver cancer. Next. So I will begin with describing the burden of liver cancer in the US with emphasis on racial ethnic differences in incidence mortality. Then I will talk about secular changes on liver disease landscape, followed by major risk factors, and particularly interaction between Hep B and Hep C with other known liver cancer risk factors. Talk about um, factors that regulate these disparities in disease risk and outcome. And finally, I will close with an example of a multi-level research in liver disease and liver cancer. Next. So um, liver cancer is one of the few cancers in the US with rising incidence and mortality. So it's one of the fastest rising causes of cancer-related death. It's the fifth and the seventh leading cancer death in the US in men and women respectively. In uh, 2021, it's been estimated we will see about 42,000 new cases and 30,000 deaths due to this cancer. So as we can see in this graph, uh, you know, while the rates of most other cancers are declining, liver cancer mortality rates have been increasing steadily since 1990 in men and women. Next. So this is burden of liver cancer is um, unequally distributed with racial ethnic minorities disproportionately affected. Historically, Asians and Pacific Islanders had the highest liver cancer rates in the US, but their rates have plateaued in around 20, 2007 and have been declining steadily. American Indians and Alaska Natives now have the highest incidence and mortality of liver cancer, followed by Hispanics, Asian Pacific Islanders, non-Hispanic Blacks, and non-Hispanic Whites. A study by Patrick et al. published in uh, JCL forecasted that liver cancer incidence rates will continue to increase through 2030 in all racial ethnic groups except in Asians and Pacific Islanders. Next. So looking at uh, the main risk factors, Hep B and Hep C are the strongest risk factors for liver cancers. The risk estimate is about 20 to 25. Other important factors for liver cancer are excessive alcohol drinking and metabolic syndrome. Now, despite lower relative risks associated with alcohol and metabolic syndrome compared to Hep B and Hep C, the high prevalence of alcohol and metabolic syndrome in the US translate to high population attributable fraction. So the magnitude of this population attributable fraction varies by population and is determined by the prevalence of particular risk factors in that specific populations. So within the US, um, Hep C had the greatest PAF in Blacks and Asians, like about 35%, while Hep B had the highest uh, population as a real fraction in Asians, like around 30%. Just for comparison, the Hep B uh, population of trivial fractions is about 50% worldwide. Next. So here are some data uh, from liver transplant candidates in the US between 2002 and 2019. So we can utilize this data to examine uh, changes in this landscape over time. 
So if you look at uh, this graph, in 2002, the most common etiology of chronic liver disease patients without liver cancer uh, was hep C, about 37%. Only 15% had alcohol-related conditions and 5% had NAFL or NASH. About 15 years later, alcohol-related liver disease has become the leading etiology and NASH came second. And hep C has gone dramatically to about 7%. Now for liver cancers, the graph on the right, hep C remained the leading indication for liver transplant at about 40%, but you can see it's trending down. Uh, NASH has surpassed alcohol liver disease now and become the second leading indication. Next slide. So here are the secular trend of disease etiology in liver transplant candidates with liver cancer. So you can see in this graph, there are differences across racial ethnic groups. For example, Hep C remained the leading etiology in whites with liver cancer. In recent years in Hispanic, NASH and alcohol have surpassed Hep C and became the top leading etiologies. In black patients with liver cancer, alcohol and Hep C together is the most common etiology. And in Asians, it's Hep B followed by Hep C. Next slide. So in the study that we have in a multi-ethnic cohort, we also found racial ethnic differences in the underlying etiology in chronic liver disease and cirrhosis. NAFLD has now become the most common cause in chronic liver disease without cirrhosis in whites, in blacks, in Japanese Americans, native Hawaiians, and Latinos. Hep C came second. Now for cirrhosis, overall Hep C remained the leading underlying cause, but the proportions vary across ethnic groups. For example, Hep C is the leading cause of cirrhosis in Blacks and Latinos, but alcohol-related disease and NASH are more common in whites, Native Hawaiians, and Japanese Americans. Next slide. Similar to the national trend I previously presented, we also observed secular changes in liver, cha liver cancer underlying etiology in the cohort. Hep C is still the most common cause of liver cancer, but in recent years, NAFL or NASH has surpassed it and is now leading. The trend for Hep B is stable and for alcohol, it seems to be trending up slightly. Uh, looking across ethnic group, Hep C is the leading underlying etiology of liver cancers in Blacks, Latinos, and Whites, while NAFL or NASH is the leading etiology in Native Hawaiians and Japanese Americans. Next slide. So reasons for the decline in Hep B and Hep C related liver disease and liver cancer um, include the success of HPV vaccination at birth, vaccination of high-risk groups, and improvements in antiviral therapy among carriers. For Hep C, it's screening among high-risk populations and effective antiviral therapy, which can significantly reduce liver cancer risk by over 50%. Next slide. Now, although the prevalence of Hep C and Hep B related liver disease and cancer has been decreasing, but there are still many other effects, risk factors that can interact with Hep B and Hep C to increase susceptibility to liver cancer as listed here. Furthermore, there are non-biological factors that can modify liver cancer susceptibilities in different populations, such as SES, healthcare excess, quality of care, um, adversity, government policy, and all these are part of what we call the social determinants of health. Next. So some examples of interactions between Hep B and Hep C with other factors that can increase liver cancer susceptibility and ethnic disparities include co-infections with other viruses such as HIV, which shown to be more common in Blacks. Um, there are evidence of interactions with obesity and metabolic syndrome. So individuals who are Hep C and Hep B positive and have diabetes or overweight or obese have increased risk of developing liver cancer. And these conditions are more prevalent in Blacks and Hispanics. There are also evidence showing interactions with alcohol drinking and smoking with Hep B and Hep C in liver cancer etiology. And certain populations have elevated prevalence of high alcohol intake. Next slide. 
So as I mentioned earlier, liver cancer disproportionately affect racial ethnic minorities, but it's also clusters in low SES areas. So this recent study using SEER registry data in the past 15 years show that within each racial ethnic groups, except in um, Alaskan American Indians and Alaskan Native, there are significant SES gradients for liver cancer incidence rate with uh, lower SES groups having higher incidence rates than the other SES groups. So from the graph here, you can see the highest incidence of liver cancer was observed among low SES Asian and Pacific Islanders. And the lowest incidence was found in high SES whites. The high incidence of liver cancer observed among Asians and Pacific Islanders likely reflects the historical impact of HPV among these groups. Next slide. So in addition to disparities in liver cancer incidence, disparity across the cancer continuum, including diagnosis, treatment, outcome, have been reported for liver cancer. Examples, Blacks have lower liver cancer screening rates. Blacks and Hispanic have higher tumor stage at diagnosis and less likely to receive curative treatment, including liver transplant. Blacks with Hep C develop liver cancer at earlier stages and present with more aggressive disease. Now it's known that diagnosis of liver cancer at an early stage is a key contributor to favorable outcomes. Um, there are significant racial ethnic disparities in overall survival. Overall, Blacks have the lowest survival and Asians have better survival compared to non-Hispanic whites. As shown in this survival graph from the same paper by Flores et al, SES is significantly associated with survival within racial ethnic groups. So the highest survival was found among high SES Asians and Pacific Islanders, and the lowest survival was found among low SES Blacks. And it's been suggested that the reason of this disparities are multifactorial and largely driven by social determinants of health. Next. As Dr. Perez Stable mentioned in his opening remarks, NIMHD has established a framework for conducting disparity research. In the context of liver cancer, this framework highlights the mechanisms underlying racial ethnic disparities in risks and across the cancer continuum are complex and multifactorial and can be attributed to many interrelated domains, including biological, behavioral, social, environmental, and healthcare systems, and levels of influence at individual, interpersonal, community, and societal. Next. So several conceptual models and studies have demonstrated the importance of multi-level approach to better elucidate determinants of racial ethnic disparities in disease risks and outcome. So to apply this multi-level approach to study liver disease and liver cancer disparities, we leverage the resource and the richness of data in the multi-ethnic cohort. So a bit background about the cohort is a prospective study of men and women from Hawaii and California established in the early 1990s. We have more than 200,000 African-Americans, Native Hawaiian, Japanese American, Latinos and whites that were aged 45 to 75 at the time of recruitment. We collected demographic and comprehensive exposure data using baseline and follow-up questionnaires. We have geospatial data in terms of outcome. We link the participants to cancer registry, uh, death certificates file, Medicare, and also California hospital discharge data. In addition to this, we also collected biological specimen from 70,000 people in the cohort. Next. So this MCI funded study is one of the first comprehensive epi studies to elucidate the determinants of liver cancer and chronic liver disease disparities in high risk minorities. We currently have close to a thousand incident liver cancer cases and 6,000 chronic liver disease cases across five ethnic groups in the cohort with an average follow up um, of about 20 years. So in this study, we leverage the rich resource of the MEC and examine the interplay between multiple factors, including genetic susceptibility from GOS data. We look at genetic ancestry, tumor characteristics. We look at detailed lifestyle and health behaviors, migration history, comorbidities, 
And we also look at social built-in environments such as neighborhood SES, ethnic enclave, and obesogenic factors. In influencing one, we're gonna look at liver cancer and chronic liver disparities. Two, we will try to understand the underlying etiology. And finally, we want to be able to look at disease survival. Next. So in summary, we are experiencing significant racial ethnic disparities in liver cancer and outcomes in the United States. There are big changes in disease landscape. While Hep B and Hep C becoming less prominent etiologies, but they remain an important etiology for liver cancer, and they're more prominent in certain ethnic groups. Though considerable progress has been made in describing disparities in Hep B and Hep C related liver cancer, data are still limited on the specific determinants that drive these disparities. So most studies suggest that disparities in hep hepatitis related disease from risks and disease outcome are driven by social determinant of health. So because of the complexity of underlying these disparities, studies in diverse cohort that collect multi-level data to characterize determinants of racial ethnic disparities in both disease risks and outcomes will be critical to expand our understanding of factors and mechanisms and also identify actionable intervention targets to reduce disparities. Next. So to close, I'd like just to acknowledge my funding sources and also my research stream at USC and also all my collaborators. Thank you very much. Thank you, Wendy. And uh, we have time for one question maybe. I see in the chat box, there is one question on, uh, can you talk about the interactions with uh, hepatitis B and other comorbidities and its effect on cirrhosis and liver cancer? Yes, so there are some evidence that shows that when somebody is positive for a, a, or a hep B carrier or hep C carrier, um, let's say if you also have a metabolic syndrome like a diabetes, um, there are interactions in terms of um, increasing their risk to progress to either develop cirrhosis faster or to develop uh, liver cancer. Okay, um, I think there's uh, some comment in the chat in terms of why can't we just go and screen people? We know how to screen. I think today's discussion is probably focused on we have tools for screening, we have tools for treatment, but it has not been taken up in underserved populations. So we are trying to understand what are the barriers and the research is trying to help us understand those barriers so we can target those barriers and get to those populations. So thank you for your comments. Keep, the, keep uh, uh, writing your comments and questions on it and we'll be happy to answer them. So let's move on to our next speaker. For today, uh, Dr. Yuchi Chen. He's an associate professor of biology at Morgan State University. His team adopts uh, interdisciplinary translational research approaches to study health outcomes and health disparities through uh, understanding host responses, cellular and molecular regulations of viral diseases, including dengue, HIV, hepatitis C, and COVID-19. So today he's going to talk to us about hepatitis C in HIV-infected men, a health disparity perspective. Dr. Chen, take it away. Okay, thank you so much for the invitation and the opportunity. Uh, so today I'm going to share with the community about our research on hepatitis C in HIV infected men uh, in a health disparities perspective. Next slide. So HIV and HCV are the infectious diseases with the most serious health disparities and the co-infections of HIV and HCV are common. And HIV co-infections can actually worsen the uh, HCV liver diseases. 
Uh, however, HCV, uh, HIV is more uh, likely to be transmitted through high-risk sexual practices. On the other hand, HCV is more likely to transmit by blood, especially through injection drug use. And also HIV and HCV have different emerging epidemics. So for HIV, it is among the young black men who have sex with men. Uh, that is the sexual transmission route. However, for HCV, it is among the suburban and rural young white persons with injection drug use, as well as in the urban settings of men who have sex with men who are either HIV positive or who use PrEP. So what about the emerging epidemic of HCV and HIV co-infection? So that's the topic for study. Next. So HIV is highly epidemic in Baltimore and Maryland and is disproportionately affecting African-Americans. So among the HIV infected people, either incident infections or prevalent infections, they are more than 70% are African-Americans. And one- Dr. Other, Chen, uh, can you speak a little louder? I uh, was hearing there's some issue with your microphone. Okay. So uh, one third of the HIV infected people in Baltimore area are, uh, are gay people. And MSM in all new HIV cases increased from 25% in 20, uh, 2005 to 60% in 2012. So what about the HCV epidemic among the people living with HIV in Baltimore? So this is the open question uh, to, uh, for study. To answer these questions, we designed a retrospective study using a cohort of 2004 HIV infected men engaged in HIV care in urban, suburban Baltimore and rural Eastern Shore of Maryland. Next slide. So this is a diverse study populations. Uh, the majority of the patients are African Americans, 71%. And also the, uh, most of them had disadvantaged social determinants of health, including lower level of education and uh, unemployment. And many of them have uh, recently diagnosed HIV. And as you can see, the risk behaviors, the, major the majority of them uh, are MSM, uh, 62%, and 20% of them have uh, injection drug use. Next slide. So then we study the prevalence of HCV in these populations using anti-HCV as the marker for ever or recent uh, or current HCV infection. And the overall prevalence is 24%. And the HCV prevalence is higher among the older people and higher among African-Americans and also among uh, uh, the people with injection drug use. And also for uh, the prevalence is higher among those with lower educational attainment or those who are uh, were in unemployed and or who have uh, ever exposed to HPV. Um, so all these factors uh, except employment are all independent predictors for prevalent HCV. And next slide. So then we look at the uh, temporal trends in HCV prevalence. So we found that the overall anti-HCV prevalence decreased over time from 38% to 24% in these populations. And this is especially um, the case for, uh, for those people with um, among the older age. And as you can see in the right hand side, so there is the emerging epidemic of, um, I think there's a problem with the, the slides. Uh, can you show the next slide, please? Uh, okay, so uh, can you go back to the previous slide? <laughs> Sorry about that, the problem. So, um, so overall prevalence decreased in these populations, especially among older patients. However, the HCV prevalence remained unabated among the younger HIV infected men. Next slide. 
And you can see the HCV prevalence remained high, about 85% of the, uh, of the men who had injection drug use. And you can uh, uh, see a, a very striking emerging HCV epidem epidemic among the younger HIV infected men who use injection drug. Um, however, the slides should be showing that the HCV epidemic remained unabated among, also among the younger HIV infected men who have sex with men. Next slide. And then we next we look at the trends uh, about racial disparities in HCV prevalence among these HIV infected men. And we found decreasing racial disparities in HCV prevalence over time. So you can see a strike, a, a remarkable reduction in HCV prevalence among the Blacks, almost 20% reduction. However, the HCV prevalence remained pretty constant among the whites and non-Black race. And for the age, uh, for the different age groups, you can see there's a dramatic reduction in HCV prevalence among the Black from the older age to the younger age. However, the HCV prevalence remained pretty constant, pretty stable in different age groups among the non-Blacks. So there's no racial disparities among the younger men uh, if, uh, look, uh, when it comes to the, uh, the racial groups. Next slide. So we want to know whether the decreasing prevalence of HCV is related to the reduction in risk behaviors. And this is, this is indeed the, the case. So we found that the decreasing racial disparities in IDU prevalence over time, and this is more strike. This reduction is more striking among the blacks. So there are there is almost twenty percent reductions uh, among the blacks in terms of IDU prevalence, and more strikingly, there is a remarkable reductions in IDU prevalence among the blacks from the older age group to younger age group. However, this trend was not observed among the non-blacks. So you can see that uh, in different, uh, the, among the whites, the prevalence of IDU is actually um, increased a little bit uh, among the younger uh, group. So in this case, we found that a huge racial disparities in older age group uh, between black and white. However, the IDU prevalence is even higher among the whites. Uh, in the younger age groups. Next slide. So we found that um, there is increasing proportions of, uh, of black men achieving higher level of educational attainment. Uh, and this, this, uh, inc this indicate that uh, educational attainment may be important social determinants for reduction in risk behavior and the subsequent HCV acquisition. And next slide. And so we also find that among the HIV infected men who use injection drugs, the percentage of white people increased dramatically among the young age groups. And this is especially the case in the rural areas. So our data indicate there is an emerging epidemic of injection drug use and subsequent HCV acquisition among young white men living with HIV, especially in the rural areas. And I think this observation has been observed in other parts of the United States as well. Uh, next slide. So when we look at the uh, independent risk factors predicting HCV acquisitions, we found that the risk factors predicting HCV infections among the older ages were no longer predictive for the younger people. So that means there is a shift in the risk, uh, uh, risk factors for HCV acquisitions uh, from older to younger generations. And when we look at the different racial groups, we find that as we mentioned before, the younger age and the higher level of education help to reduce the HCV uh, prevalence among the Blacks. However, these risk factors are not predictive for the whites. So the different racial groups have different risk factors for predicting HCV acquisition. 
Next slide. So when we stratify, uh, when we analyze the risk factors by stratifying uh, by different risk uh, behaviors, such as IDU versus non-IDU or MSM versus non-MSM, we, um, we find that there's almost not a entirely on non-overlapping risk factors for different risk groups. So that means the risk factors that we identify by analyzing overall cohort may not be used accurately to predict the HCV infections in different risk groups. So it is important to, uh, uh, to identify uh, group specific risk factors for HCV acquisition. Next slide. So what about H, uh, HCV treatment initiations? So we found there is uh, differences, racial differences in uh, interferon treatment initiation. So it is higher amount of whites compared to the black. However, this racial difference is no longer uh, significant after controlling for other factors. Next slide. So it is interesting that among the patients entering care towards the end of interferon eras, we found that the higher educational attainment was the only independent determinants of HCV treatment initiation. So it will be interesting to determine whether or not educational attainment persists as an important social determinants for initiation of HCV DAA treatment in the following years. Next slide. And then, then we uh, look at the new epidemic. We want to know what is going on with the new epidemic as indicated by incident HCV infections. So among these populations, we identified 42 incident infections and the majority of them, 81% were actually MSM without injection drug use. And you can see the uh, incident rate is higher among the younger ones in a uh, non-black, non-white race and in urban settings and uh, among people using injection drug and also MSM. However, there's no racial differences in terms of incident HCV infections between white and black. And next. And also we observed a resurgent, resurgence of incident HCV among HIV infected men. This is especially remarkable among HIV infected MSM without IDU. So there's a, a increase of incident infections uh, since 2011. And next slide. Then we want to uh, determine what risk factors are associated with incident HCV among MSM who did not use injection drug use. So first, we found that incident HCV is more likely to occur among the MSM who had more than one type of allogenital ST, uh, sexually transmitted infections, especially those who had ulcerative allogen allogenital STIs, including syphilis or herpes simplex virus. This indicates that these people have high, uh, the people have higher uh, risk of sexual behaviors are more likely to have incident HCV. Next slide. And we also found that incident HCV are more likely to occur among MSM who use methamphetamines, especially among those MSM who use more than one type of recreational drug. So that means poly drug use is uh, uh, important factors for uh, incident HCV acquisition. Next slide. And paradoxically, we found that among the MSM with the IDU, the uh, higher level of education actually a predictive of incident HCV infection. And also compared to the unemployed MSM, those MSM with employment are actually at higher risk of incident HCV infection. And next slide. So we run- Dr. Chen, can you please wrap it up? Okay, so we found that uh, recently infected, uh, recently diagnosed HIV and also STIs and poly drug use are risk factors, but also, uh, next slide. So interestingly, as 
stated in our, the title of our publications, we found that favorable social economic status and recreational poly drug use are linked with sexual hepatitis C infection among HIV infected men who have sex with men. Next slide. So the data from uh, uh, our cohorts show that the health disparities in HCV HIV co-infections are complex and can be paradoxical and constantly evolving. So one factor can actually have opposing effect depending on what uh, which health outcomes are being measured. And that means tailored pub health, public health strategies are needed to achieve HCV eliminations in different populations. Next slide. So uh, the, our ongoing studies use a community-based prospective study cohort of more than 5,000 HIV patients or PrEP users in urban Baltimore and rural Maryland. So our ultimate goal is to demonstrate the feasibility of achieving HCV elimination in this population through linkage of HIV care and prevention to HCV detection and treatment, and eventually uh, HCV elimination. Next slide. I, I want to thank NIMHD for funding support and my external collaborators, Dr. Theo, Dr. Cox, Dr. Weiberg, and Dr. Hughes for their help. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Chen. And uh, I think in the interest of time, I would suggest, Dr. Chen, there are a couple of questions for you on the chat box. You may want to address them, especially on uh, the prevalence of HCV in, uh, HIV PrEP users uh, and some other questions. So um, let's move on to the next speaker, Dr. Martin Shapiro. Uh, he is a professor of medicine at Real Cornell Medical College. And he's a distinguished professor emeritus of medicine and public health at UCLA. Uh, at UCLA, he had served as the Division Chief of General Internal Medicine and Health Services Research for 25 years. His research has focused upon access to and disparities in care. So today he's going to present on racial, ethnic, and socioeconomic disparities in care for hepatitis C. What do we know and what do we need to learn? Dr. Shapiro, take it away. Thank you very much. First, my colleagues and I want to thank NIH and NIDDK for funding our study uh, uh, on disparities in diffusion of direct acting antiviral meds for hep C now in its first year. Next slide, please. John Dunn wrote, any man's death diminishes me because I am involved in mankind. HCV is a problem of utmost urgency. Over the last decade, annual acute cases have tripled, are occurring largely in persons aged 20 to 39, and are 2.8 times as common in indigenous peoples as in non-Hispanic whites. In 2018, over 137,000 chronic cases were newly reported by 37 states. This acceleration is being fueled by the opioid epidemic, the problem is not going away and is being exacerbated by the pandemic. Next slide. Chronic infection is more than twice as common in African Americans as in whites. Rates vary in Hispanic subpopulations and estimates uh, for indigenous peoples vary widely but are substantial. Next slide. More people die uh, of HCV each year than from any other chronic infectious disease, including HIV. Since the introduction of DAAs in 2013, there's been a slow decline in annual deaths, but total deaths from 2014 to 2018 exceed 90,000. Next slide. Blacks are almost twice as likely to die as whites. Even though prevalence is lower in Hispanics than in whites, their mortality is significantly higher. Indigenous peoples have the greatest mortality and have improved the least since 2013. More than 10% of the deaths since 2013 represent excess deaths in Blacks, Hispanics, and Indigenous peoples relative to whites. Next slide. Um, of course, um, all these 90,000 deaths are of concern. 
Why are so many people continuing to die from hep C or none of these deaths avoidable? Is this all a manifestation of the patient's disease or is it also related to system provider and patient factors affecting receipt of care? Next slide. The science of studying healthcare depends on methods that are no less sophisticated than those of molecular genetics. This model is a little different from the one that Eliseo presented, but it has many of the same elements. Our conceptual model in our study takes account of predisposing, enabling, and need variables that can affect use of care and outcomes at the individual, interpersonal, community, system, and society levels. Next slide, please. Among Medicare beneficiaries through 2016, Hispanics, women, persons with lower incomes and less education uh, were less likely to receive DAAs. That was also true uh, uh, for um, African Americans in 2014, but not after that. Next slide, please. Uh, other potentially relevant issues in terms of disparities include Blacks being less likely to be listed for or to receive liver transplants and receiving less care and having inferior outcomes for hepatocellular CA, as Dr. Setiawan indicated, as well as differential care for opioid users, Medicaid beneficiaries and the uninsured, the high cost of medications, and at least until recently, the issue with prior authorization in Medicaid and some other insurers. Next slide, please. Studying problems that impede HIV uh, or HCV eradication and that perpetuate disparities in sufficient detail to be able to design, uh, test, and implement interventions nationwide to address them would re require collection of unbiased and detailed national data from patients, clinicians, and medical records. HHS invested heavily in efforts to optimize care for persons with HIV in the late 1990s. Among other efforts, they contributed $24 million to the HIV cost and services utilization study, but also received other funding. I was fortunate to be the PI of that study, and I will talk about it briefly because it illuminates what that kind of health services research and community engaged scholarship can contribute to formulation of informed health policy as well as how rapidly it is possible to make progress in addressing a serious problem. Next slide, please. To produce unbiased national data, HICSIS used a three-stage PPS probability sample of people in care in early 1996. The stages were communities, practices within communities, sampled based on caseload, and patients within practices. The inverse of uh, uh, each patient's probability of selection was their weight in the national estimates. Hundreds of practice sites were involved, ranging from large public hospitals to individual practices. Next slide. 13 research teams with about 70 investigators nationally were assembled to study many issues, including viral genetics, treatment access, patient behavior, provider attitudes, and mental health. There were community partners on all of the research teams. Next slide. We were able to track uh, diffusion of heart treatment during its first two years of availability. Progress was spectacular, reaching over 85% of patients during that time, but it was uneven. Men did better than women. Next slide. Whites did better than Blacks or Hispanics. Next slide. And those with private insurance, uh, 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 did better than those with Medicaid or who were uninsured. Next slide. Other findings pertinent to health disparities and HCV included, many went without care because they needed the money for food, clothing, or housing, lacked transport, or could not get off work. Those who had care managers, often through the Ryan White program, were more likely to get heart therapy. Blacks were less likely to be enrolled in clinical trials and waited much longer for heart than whites unless they saw black physicians. And generalist physicians who considered themselves to be HIV experts provided care comparable to, to specialists. Study findings supported the reauthorization of the Ryan White Care Act, which currently receives about $2 billion annually to support HIV care. Next slide. 
In our current project, a multidisciplinary team from several institutions in New York State and Alabama are studying diffusion of DAAs. We are analyzing Medicare and Medicaid data by race and ethnicity and by neighborhood measures of social determinants of health. We also are interviewing and surveying patients at diverse sites in New York State and Alabama, as well as generalist and specialist providers throughout New York State and in Alabama and some uh, adjoining states to identify patient experiences and barriers to care and provider factors accepting receipt of care. Next slide. We've adapted our study to the changing national testing and treatment guidelines we'd originally intended to study care for baby boomers, but now include all adults. And we've expanded our Medicaid analyses from two states to all 50 plus DC, um, and have expanded primary data collection to include opioid treatment programs. Next slide. We will explore an array of patient-related factors, including stigma related to HCV, HIV, and opioid use. Uh, perceived discrimination, trust in medical providers, beliefs about HCV and its treatment, access and barriers, including insurance denials, distance to travel, availability of specialists and language spoken, uh, competing needs, life chaos, insurance type and characteristics, uh, or lack thereof, mental health and substance use disorders. Next slide. We also will explore uh, such provider and system factors as whether they accept the patient's insurance, attitudes to persons with HCV, HIV, and opioid use disorder among providers, HCV knowledge and experience of providers, confidence in their ability to initiate DAAs and monitor treatment, special, uh, specialty access, uh, and specialists' perceptions of the opportunity cost of providing care for this condition. Next slide, please. Our study should provide useful information about recent patterns of care uh, for uh, patients with fee-for-service Medicare and Medicaid throughout the US and insights about provider experiences in a few states and of patients at selected sites as to why some patients are not receiving the care that they need. However, it will not provide nationally representative data on why disparities persist and, and people are dying in the numbers that they are. Next slide, please. A decade ago, Brian Brink, the chief medical officer of Anglo-American, the multinational mining corporation based in South Africa, set an aspirational goal for control of HIV, zero tolerance for new HIV infections or for opportunistic infections or for deaths from HIV. Can't the United States do at least as much for HCV? To accomplish this, we need more than abstract targets. We need the resources to collect data that will allow those targets to be pursued on the basis of ample evidence. Next slide. We urgently need comprehensive data on patterns of testing and treatment for HCV and treatment for end-stage liver disease, cirrhosis, hepatocellular CA, and patterns of use of liver transplantation. We need to understand patient, provider, system, and societal factors contributing to these patterns of care. And we also need uh, well-funded intervention trials in all populations to optimize care and outcomes and implement implementation studies to assure findings are applied widely. Are intervention trials to improve care and implementation studies the business of agencies that fund health research? Shouldn't those be left to health systems as part of their QI programs? I think not. The goal of health research agencies is not only to make fundamental discoveries, but also to assure that knowledge is applied to enhancement of health. Toward that end, governments have to play a central role in planning and financing such studies, which are as essential a part of health research as the development of drugs and vaccines. Next slide. This model developed, uh, uh, that uh, I was involved in developing in collaboration with Robert Kaplan, the former Associate Director for Behavioral and Social Sciences at NIH and Arlene Brown of UCLA, illustrates why this kind of work is needed. To get from risk or disease to optimal health outcomes, treatments are needed that might be biological, social, behavioral, cognitive, or environmental. 
And one of the first orders of business is to assure that all persons who need these treatments are getting them, and if not, why not? Health services research generates data on outcomes, costs, and disparities. When research is community engaged, it can provide textured information on the full range of barriers, beliefs, and behaviors that may impede adoption. Such studies provide evidence that can inform implementation studies to increase adoption of treatments in order to improve outcomes and diminish disparities. They also inform the design of new treatments or interventions when the existing ones are insufficient to the task. These implementation and intervention studies need to be conducted with greatest rigor in all populations who stand to benefit with community buy-in and with careful measurement of patterns of care and of social, medical, and economic outcomes. When problems cannot be solved at the level of patient, practitioner, or health system, the need of treatment may be policy change, perhaps in the form of something like the Ryan White program, informed by this kind of work. Our study and some others are attempting to contribute knowledge that moves us down this path for HCV. We might say that health research agencies everywhere should take as their maxim that any person's avoidable death diminishes them because they are involved in humankind, that their application of knowledge always should include partnering with communities as well as clinicians in health systems, and that they will appropriate sufficient resources to identify and address effectively all of the impediments to full adoption by all populations of treatments and other interventions that can enhance health. Thank you. Thank you, Martin, and uh, thank you to all the speakers. We have a lot of uh, questions that are coming up in the chat box, but we have a few more um, uh, people to uh, present to you. And uh, John, do you want to take over the discussant panel or sure. how do you want this to run? Yeah, we'll do this together. We have uh, several panelists. I know some people have raised hands. Please go ahead and put your comments in the chat so we can make sure we capture them and we'll do our best to cycle back to hear from you. But we have invited several panelists to uh, get a little bit more what's going on uh, at the implementation and service delivery uh, uh, level. Um, and um, and there, there are three listed here with their uh, titles. Um, and uh, next slide, uh, please, to... Um, uh, uh, to, uh, to, to get to their um, comments. We'll first be hearing from Dr. Jorge Mira, who's the director of the ACV Elimination Program for the Cherokee Nation of Eastern Oklahoma. Uh, Jorge. Thank you, John, and thank you for, uh, to the organizing committee for uh, inviting me to be part of this panel. So next slide, please. So I have the honor to serve a community who unfortunately has suffered uh, great disparities, especially with, uh, uh, specifically with hepatitis C, which is the Native American community. I'm the director for uh, Cherokee Nation uh, Infectious Disease Program. And this disparities not only go to the individual level, but when you look at elimination programs, uh, on the left hand side, you see a map of the United States, which depicts the American Indian and Alaska Native population as a percentage of county population. You can see the, the greatest concentration of Native Americans is in the west and south, south, southwestern part of the United States. The majority of these uh, Native Americans live in uh, uh, Oklahoma and California. When you look at the right um, side of the screen, uh, the map of the United States with uh, hepatitis C and hepatitis B elimination programs uh, updated until March of last year, which was basically pre-COVID, uh, the yellow uh, states or cities mark the hepatitis C elimination programs, and the majority of them are in the east and not in the west. And um, the two states mostly populated by Native Americans, Oklahoma and California, have just very few programs, um, one of them being ZARS in, in northeastern Oklahoma. Uh, next slide, please. So I just wanna highlight a few points that uh, made uh, the start of our program of hepatitis C elimination and the, the factors that I think have been critical. So the first one is political commitment from the tribal leadership. On the left-hand side in the pink shirt is uh, our previous uh, chief, um, Chief Bill John Baker, 
who took uh, hepatitis C elimination very seriously, especially since other speakers have uh, mentioned that Native Americans have the highest incidence and highest mortality to this disease. And in 2015, uh, the year that we started our program, he um, proclaimed uh, October 31st as the Cherokee Nation HCB Awareness Day. And in 2017, he could, could continue to commit to our program, expanding the concept to a Hepatitis C Elimination Day. Next slide, please. So beyond political commitment, which is critical for any program to be successful, uh, the other things that I want to highlight was expansion of hepatitis C care to the primary care providers. On the left, uh, the, the graph on the left, in July of 2014, before we started our elimination program, we empowered our primary care providers to treat hepatitis C. This was accompanied with the appearance of DAAs on the market, but you cannot, uh, you have someone, you need someone to deliver the medications or prescribe them. So we increased uh, pharmacists and primary care providers knowledge in treating hepatitis C. And you can see in the blue line, which is the cumulative number of patients treated, how it drastically increased in the following 12 months. On the right hand side is our uh, hepatitis C cascade of care uh, from 2015 through 2017. And empowering these physicians uh, increased our uh, screening program. We did universal screening from the start. We were able to detect 50% of our estimated infected uh, population with hepatitis C and uh, over almost 85% of the patients were evaluated and, uh, and about 60% started treatment. Next, please. So finally, I just want to point out that we took a holistic approach to the patient, uh, trying, to, trying to conduct a one-stop shop. So a patient uh, would be contacted by a navigator once we knew that they were positive, engaged in the clinic. If, they, if MAT was medication-assisted treatment was needed, it was provided by the same providers and the uh, pharmacists in our clinic. So taking this holistic approach, we were able to treat a substantial amount of patients. Nevertheless, our future has to focus on our gaps. If you can see the number of detectable patients with our HCV RNA, uh, 1,250, uh, when we looked at how many actually initiated treatment, it was 55%. So there's a gap of 45% of patients who we diagnose and at never get uh, started on treatment. In the future, we think that the test and treat approach is gonna to have to be implemented among many other things. But having medications on the shelf and being able to treat the patient the first day we diagnose their hepatitis C it's going to be crucial for, a hepatitis, for our hepatitis C elimination program. And I'll stop there and be happy to take any questions as, if there are any. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ore. Uh, uh, we will take questions. Please place them in the chat. Uh, we want to make sure we get everybody uh, out in front who we've been invited to, uh, to provide remarks as panelists. Uh, let's turn now to Dr. Natasha Travis, who's the attending physician at Grady Liver Clinic and assistant professor of medicine at Emory University School of Medicine, talk about the ACB uh, um, um, primary care program, a uh, primary uh, liver, primary liver care program at at, uh, at a Grady uh, Hospital, and and particularly its work with hepatitis C uh, testing and treatment. Dr. Travis. Hey everyone, my name is Natasha Travis, and I'm one of the Grady Liver Clinic faculty. Thank you for allowing us a moment to share a little bit about our clinic and our post hepatitis C treatment and screening. Next slide, please. All right, the Grady Health System is located in Atlanta, Georgia. It includes the Grady Memorial Hospital and six neighborhood health centers. Our hospital is the largest hospital in the state of Georgia with 953 licensed beds. It's uh, considered an urban safety net hospital taking care of largely un and underinsured patients. It is also the teaching house, a teaching site for the Emory University School of Medicine and the Morehouse School of Medicine. And it is estimated that 25% of Georgia physicians re receive at least some of their training at, at the Grady Hospital. So if you can imagine, we have been able to make a pretty big impact on providers that are getting trained and learning about hepatitis C treatment, um, screening and, and everything that comes along with that. On the primary care side, the Grady Primary Care Center pr provides 
care to 55,000 patients annually. Our clinics serve a primarily older, female, African-American, and lower socioeconomic status population. Approximately 40% of our outpatient clinics are patient patients in our outpatient clinics are uninsured. And of those who are insured, um, the rest are mostly Medicare and Medicaid. Our patients are known to face barriers to care, which we know can also often lead to poor health outcomes. And as an added barrier, uh, prior research done in the late 90s showed that we also have a concern about inadequate functional health literacy in our patient population. These are all the reasons why our primary care clinics and our liver clinic model needed to be created with our patient population in mind. Next slide. The primary care center actually houses the Grady Liver Clinic, which was founded in 2002. Our clinic is a very unique model for hepatitis C care as it is run entirely by general internists um, who have expertise in hepatitis C treatment. As such, the Grady Liver Clinic has become a model of excellence for non-traditional approaches to hepatitis C care as it is, uh, improves access to care and, uh, and patients with healthcare disparities. Next slide. Using a multidisciplinary team approach, including physicians, clinical pharmacists, nurses, and patient navigators, the Grady Liver Clinic has been nationally recognized for implementation of large-scale hepatitis D screening and linkage to care as well as treatment programs. Our services are multi-pronged and include counseling, education about the disease state, um, vaccination for hepatitis A and B, and of late we have added influenza, pneumonia vaccine, and coronavirus vaccine as there, if there is a care gap there, and evaluation of comorbidities such as cirrhosis or HIV, which may impact our treatment recommendations. Most importantly, our services include initiation of treatment and monitoring of patients on retroviral therapy. Once the patients have content, uh, finished treatment, those patients who need additional services, such as uh, monitoring of hepatocellular carcinoma, will continue to be seen. And um, we have also been seeing patients who have other comorbidities, such as alcohol use disorders, things that will, you know, to, to make their uh, liver uh, treatment uh, in the future uh, more imperative uh, for us to, to keep, keep, keep in mind. Next slide, please. The Grady Liver Clinic has tested over 25,000 Grady patients for hepatitis C. We have revealed a, um, a prevalence of 10% in our population, and we think that we are very proud of the work that we have done. Our clinic has been extremely busy. We see approximately 500 patients annually. We are uh, proud to report that we have a 96% cure rate. And you can see on our slide that we have improved over time and we are looking forward to the future of what we can um, have and provide in our clinics. Next slide. Um, we wanna thank you for allowing us to speak and we're, we'll be available for any questions if you have any. Thank you so much for that um, rapid overview. Hopefully we'll have some time for questions. We have one more panelist to hear from. Um, so let's go to uh, the next slide, please. Peter, I don't know if you had any slides, but feel free to share your screen if you do. But if not, feel free to take the floor. Yeah, please. Ada, go ahead, uh, unmute yourself. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for inviting me as this panel. Uh, we hit about a lot of clinical stuff. So I'm not talking about clinical, I'm talking about just outreach, how we reach our patient and what we can do to help them. So that is my goal for today. So first of all, um, I'd like to um, just thank you. You know, my team have a privilege to working with the Fox Chase uh, Cancer Center Temple University to working for the hepatitis B, C, liver cancer prevention. We starting this program back in 2019. So we start this program and then the methodology to talk about it is like we try to conducting workshop throughout the New York City for age 21 and up and collecting the data into the data bank. Um, we did it on the, uh, the we have like P survey. So we want to test how much they know about the, the disease. And then we will follow up, we will have a workshop. So we will explain to them like, you know, the type of hepatitis and then, we, and then uh, we want to know how they can protect themselves and what kind of treatment they can have. And then we want to break the barrier about the, the, the myth and the fact of the disease. 
And then, up, and then we also, after that, we'll do a poll survey, the same set of questions, but we do a poll survey and we will try to understand after the workshop, how much the people will gain the knowledge or understand the, the disease. So that is how we did it for the methodology for the survey. And then after six months, we will have our community nurse Esther to call each participant to make sure they will follow up with their PCP or their doctor to see if they going back and ask them their doctor if have been they tested or before. And doing the preparation. So um, as you know, the Chinese people will have most like different dialect. And then the most common one is the Cantonese and the Mandarin. And then it's two types of um, written format. It's one is super fry and then the other one was traditional. At the beginning, when then um, the, all the material from uh, Temple University, they forward to it is only for the simple fry. But our team feel that because um, most of the simplify will be using for the people immigrant from China. But for the, the rest of the world, most people are still using the traditional form. So our team helped them to translate another set for the traditional material, everything. So we have one set in simplify and the other set in traditional. And besides that, and then we look at all the material and then we find that some of the, um, the language may not be the sensitive to both sides. So we also changed the, uh, the language a little bit and set it back to uh, Dr. Yin Tan to make sure you know, uh, everything is cultural sensitive to all. Um, and then what we can do, um, and then we also did a mock survey before we we usually launching out for the uh, for the workshop because we want to make sure everything is smooth. Everybody understand uh, the questionnaire, and then we have to be understand the questionnaire. If, if not, we cannot just present it to the community. So, when then once that we found out that was on the food portion because, as you know, the Chinese people we are eating family size. Western people they all usually have a big chunk of a meat and then cut a piece and then you know you separate. And then we, we fixed a little bit and then we did a foot portion uh, slide and help them to understand the foot portion, which make it the, uh, the data collect much easier and then you know, put more uh, accuracy uh, on, the, uh, on the survey. And then also you cut down about the calculation. And then we also provide a hotline for our nurse. So if any participant want to call us and find out more information about this survey, we will have a person to you know, call them back and explain to them you know, what is this survey about and what is this education about, okay? Uh, and then we doing the, um, and then we have a, we also have some problem when we're doing the initial, uh, when we're starting to doing the survey. So at the beginning, we do it on paper. So some of the patients always raising a question. They say like, oh, uh, I did it like many years ago, but I did not remember my result. What should I do? You know, my doctor told me everything is okay. What does that mean? And then some of them is like, well, I tested many years ago, but I forgot the result. So we usually tell them you, you already tested, just put down yes. You, you never tested, just say no, okay? And um, so that's what we did. And also we emphasize for those people if you already see a doctor, make sure when you go back to the doctor next time, make, make sure you ask them to give you a, a blood test result. So you will have a record. So you know exactly you have it or you didn't have it before. So that is how we did. Um, during the, the COVID, because everything had, was suspended, you know, we cannot do the face-to-face -face anymore. So we was working with the, um, the Dr. Yan's group we a, develop a online survey. So we have to train a lot of people, put a lot of effort and make sure everybody understand how to do it. And then most Chinese people, I'm telling you, the computer is not computer savvy. So we have to train one by one, put it in a lot of effort. In terms of the recruitment, okay? So we have to, by contacting the local uh, community-based social uh, center, including church, you know, and then the individual who can, you know, pay a key uh, communication network, okay? And then we also did some um, announcement 
at our Zoom workshop. So we put those people, we send them tons of flyer. We go through the Facebook, we go through the WeChat, and then we finally get some, we finally have the um, enough participant to participate. So uh, actually we just finished the project uh, two months ago. Mm -hmm. And, but when we doing the, uh, the, 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 the scheduling, we, we, we always ask the people what language, like what dialect you speak, because the most common one I said is two. So we try to put in, if they speak all Cantonese, they put it in one section. And then if they put it in Mandarin, we try to put another section for them to accommodate a day. And because the workshop plus all this survey, it takes about 1.5 hour. So it's a little long you know, for a lot of people. Okay, um, so we ask them like, you know, is, is it uh, the morning, the day, which time is best for you? We try to plug in the section and we try to recruit as like, uh, we, we're not doing a, uh, a large group because this we did it on the, um, on the Zoom. So we only do it like the max is like 15 people per session. Thank okay. you. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. I think we're uh, uh, running over time. So I think we, more information about your survey and about your program we'll, we'll put um, together with the other materials for the webinar, um, um, Ada. And thank you very much for uh, describing that community-based program uh, to us. Uh, I know we're a bit over time. I'm gonna thank the speakers and the panelists, but we, uh, for those who do wanna stay over time for a few minutes, uh, we can keep um, the discussion going for a while uh, uh, for those that, that do have an opportunity to stay. Um, I do want to really appre fully appreciate Dr. Shapiro's uh, call to action. There should be zero tolerance, certainly for HCV related mortality. I mean, no one should be dying of hepatitis C when you have this degree of safe, highly effective, curable treatments that um, uh, can follow uh, the reliable tests that we have, particularly now when every adult is being recommended to be tested by CDC and the USPSTF. And I would also squarely put that uh, goal in front of uh, the HIV programs in the United States. Uh, uh, you know, with you have people in, uh, over in, in, in care where you have viral suppression being achieved for HIV infected people, they should be getting screened and cured of their hepatitis C. And I almost, I really believe at this stage, someone with HIV that is dying of hepatitis C deserves a full uh, 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 exploration as to why uh, our care system failed that uh, individual. Um, I do wanna appreciate uh, uh, Geraldina Dominguez, who electronically has had uh, the hand up for quite some time. And I don't know if she's still on uh, the line, but um, uh, if you are, uh, 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 you should be able to, um, to talk now, uh, Geraldina, um, if you uh... I, 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 no, I'm sorry. It was a mistake. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so sorry. OK, all right. Was... Thank you for recognizing okay. it. All right. It all right. was a very right. interesting uh, discussion. OK, good. Very good. I was just. Uh, uh, I, uh, I do have a question uh, from the chat. I was wondering if uh, the panelists would like to take it. There is a gap barrier to connecting patients to medications for HCV treatment for clients of community-based organizations servicing underserved populations, restrictions of pharmacy benefits via managed care arrangements only allow clients to receive treatment via mail order. Outcomes are optimized if we can complete linkage and the initiation of treatment. How can this be addressed and overcome? Um, anybody, Martin, or anybody wants to take this question? Well, I, I'm certainly not, not an expert, uh, nor a beloved friend of the pharmaceutical industry and the way things get distributed. Uh, but um, uh, there are systemic problems in healthcare in the United States. And um, uh, that kind of thing is one of them, where lots of parties have the incentive to place barriers in the way of expenditures. And uh, that sometimes seems to take precedence over the saving of lives, which is presumably, as Dr. Ward was suggesting, uh, what this is all supposed to be about. And so uh, uh, th that, that, that's the kind of fix that would have to occur on a policy level. 
along with a lot of others. I mean, I remember in the first seminar in this series, there was talk about how we need to get all the people who are uninsured treated. Yes, well, <laughs> uh, hard to imagine that happening uh, uh, as manna coming down from heaven. It needs to happen because policies allow it to happen. Mm -hmm. There was another question on um, uh, interesting presentation on HIV and HCV. Um, do patients become reinfected after treatment? Maybe it's for Dr. Chen. Yes, indeed. And uh, we found uh, among those um, patients, co-infected patients who achieve SVR, meaning cure, 22. Can you percent. speak a little louder? Yeah, sorry. Yeah. To the microphone. OK. Sorry about the, the technical problem. So um, among the, uh, we have 22 patient, co-infected patients who uh, become cured of HCV. And among them, after one year of SVR, six of them actually become reinfected. And more interestingly, five of them, uh, only one of them have uh, injection drug use and the other five are actually uh, get reinfections through sexual transmissions of HCV. So I think that represent also reflect the new trend of uh, HCV epidemic among men who have sex with men. Any other of our care providers on the line would like to talk about this issue of reinfection? Uh, uh, Jorge, Dr. Travis. Sure. I mean, so yes, yeah, so reinfection is a problem, but it's in, in our community, it's not a major issue. And we have the policy of treating a patient who gets reinfected, you know, again, and, and not uh, blocking treatment for that reason. I mean, it shouldn't be a punishment. It, it's just like any other disease when they have a flare, we just, you just treat that flare again. Um, we, the, we, in my program, we don't have a, a great population of HIV, HCV co-infection. Uh, we do have a, a substantial amount of uh, people who inject drugs and, uh, and the inf reinfection rates that we've been able to measure are less than 10% so far, one year off after treatment. So it is a problem, but it's not a surmountable issue. Our, our main biggest issue what has been mentioned is having medications on the shelf to treat patients the day that they are ready to start treatment. But in not doing that, we lose 25 or 30 percent of the patients who won't return. And I'm sure that if we were able to provide them with those medications, the same way we gave hypertension medications to someone has hypertension on the same day, um, many of them would take the treatments and we have, we would have higher cure rates. Mm -hmm. Dr. Travis. Yes, thank you. Um, we also have a relatively um, low population of co-infection with HIV and HCV. We do have a population of pa patients who continue to use IV drugs and we actually have been trying to do our best to implement treatment programs or partner with other treatment programs in the community to help with IV drug use in particular. Um, the benefit of our program is that we are using pharmacists and uh, nurses, and we have several touch points for patients. So even if once we complete treatment with them, they have had at least four or five touch points with us talking about education for um, how to keep your liver healthy. And that includes, you know, cessation of alcohol use and IV drug use. So this is a problem that, you know, we have to as a community come up with better ways to help IV drug users. Um, and we are uh, willing to partner with whoever we can in the community to help those patients navigate from our clinics, also to um, at the same time have treatment for their IV drug use. Thank you. You know, you need to be getting down to the population at highest risk for infection and that's people who inject drugs. And so if you're getting some reinfection, as is noted in the uh, chat, uh, you, you're really getting to the population that is most in need of that service, together with other prevention services to reduce their risk of reinfection, such as access to safe injection equipment and drug treatment. And unfortunately, in almost all parts of the country, uh, that uh, access is, uh, is, uh, is, is woefully inadequate. Um, and, and so that's the other part of a, of a comprehensive approach that's needed to prevent uh, transmission for this population. Um, uh, I want to uh, thank everyone for the discussion. I wish we had more time. 
um, you know, please continue to uh, you know, give us feedback about the, uh, the webinar on the poll and also just by sending uh, information to us. I'm at jward at taskforce.org. Um, I think we certainly hit uh, um, why uh, the attention to disparities is important for when we think of hepatitis elimination, some of the more and morbidity mortality consequences of that, some of the key elements of uh, effective um, responses, political commitment, culturally appropriate uh, programs, um, and, and then and, and chipping away at these multiple barriers to care. Um, so I want to thank all of the speakers and panelists for bringing these uh, issues to light, which will help us um, build a response to them. And I'll turn it over, back over to my uh, colleague, Dr. Doss, for her remarks uh, to close. Thank you. Yeah, John, I really want to echo and thank all the speakers and the panelists for spending time and sharing your um, thoughts with us and really shining light as to what are some of the issues that the populations are facing and what all we need to do in future. So thank you all for your participation. And I really want to congratulate you for sharing these wonderful results with us and hope to see you su su succeed in your community efforts and eliminating hepatitis. Thank you all. Thank you. Good night. Bye-bye. Okay. Thank you again. And again, go to globalhab.org for uh, all this information together, and we'll have another webinar in the series in July. Thank you. Thank you.